We are continuing our study in Genesis. We're in chapter 6, as I said today. And um, as I said a, a, a moment ago, well, one of the things that we know about God in the Bible is he takes sin very seriously. Something that God takes seriously. Uh, the prophet Isaiah was speaking to the people of Israel. Boy, is this going to be a technical difficulty? Are you still on there? Ah, oh, there we go. Isaiah 59 2. The prophet Isaiah was speaking to the people of Israel as they had turned their backs on God. And he said, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And of course, we just celebrated uh, the Lord's Supper that reminds us of Christ. Christ's death on the cross for sin. In Genesis 6, we're going to see that God's grief over, sick, or over sin uh, reaches a tipping point uh, to where God responds to the wickedness of the world. Uh, would you stand with me? We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And as we, know, as we read verses 1 through 8, I, I want us to notice what Moses wants the people of Israel to see about the people living on the earth before the flood, okay? He says, when mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind, who bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created off the face of the earth together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, I just pray today as we get into this very important passage, God, that you would speak to us. It's a difficult passage, Lord, so I, I pray that you would help us to understand uh, what it is that you want to say from your word. We know this is your word. This is your revelation. So God, we pray that you would speak to us and guide us in truth and grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the question that I'm going to be addressing today as, as we get into this passage is what should we know about the increase of wickedness in our world? What should we know about the increase of wickedness in our world? And there's two main points. Here's the first point. It's on your outline if you want to follow along. An increase of wickedness leads God to put in place a plan for judgment. God's patience with a wicked, wicked world can only go so far. Now, you need to know that Genesis 6, 1 through 4, is probably the most difficult text in Genesis to interpret. It's a very challenging text. Um, there are so many different views on it. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, even conservative evangelical scholars have a variance of views on what verses 1 through 4 really mean. Let me give you an example. Uh, John Selhamer, who was an Old Testament theologian and Bible scholar, he taught at Golden Gate Seminary for many years, a Southern Baptist. He taught that verses 1 through 4 and verses 5 through 8 were two different sections. He taught that verses 1 through 4 was simply a summary of chapter 5 of what Pastor Matt preached on last week, the line of Seth. He said if we read verses 1 through 4 as a summary of chapter 5, there is little to arouse our suspicion that the events recounted are anything out of the ordinary. Okay, he doesn't see anything out of the ordinary in these verses. He sees verses 5 through 8 as beginning the account of the flood, which we'll get into next week. Another Southern Baptist theologian, uh, Dr. Peter Gentry from Southern Seminary, has a vastly different interpretation of verses 1 through 4. Gentry, in verses 1 through 4, sees the increase of wickedness on the earth, especially in the area of sexuality, the perversion of sexuality. And so because of that, he sees that leading into God's judgment on the earth. So here's my point. Here's two highly respected Baptist theologians that have vastly different views of these verses, okay? These are challenging verses. And along with their views, there are a whole myriad of other views. So we're going to need God's help today to figure out what is God saying to us in these obscure verses in Genesis 6. Well, let's start with verse 1 through 2. Moses says, when mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. Now, the last two sermons in this text, we have, we have talked about the expansion of mankind. Uh, three weeks ago, I talked about the, the expansion of the line of Cain, right? The family of Cain and, and how they grew in ingenuity, but they also grew in wickedness. And both sons and daughters were born in the lineage of Cain. Pastor Matt last week talked about the line of Seth. That the line of Seth also continued to grow. And that sons and daughters were also born in the line of Seth. So the population of the earth continued to grow. And it grew rapidly, right? Because people lived long lives. Now, verse 2 says, The sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful. And they took any they chose as wives for themselves. Hey guys, has God made women beautiful? Yes. <laughs> he has. Do you remember back in, in chapter 2 when, when Adam saw Eve for the first time? Remember what he said? He said, finally, finally, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. I will call her woman. I still have that same reaction when Vanessa walks down the stairs before we go out to dinner. I'm like, wow, God has made women beautiful. Now, if God didn't make women beautiful, then there would be no such thing as lust, right? Because lust is the worship of beauty. But if God didn't make women beautiful, then there would no, be no such thing as sexual attraction either. And sexual attraction is a natural thing that God has made. Without sexual attraction, the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it would not be fulfilled. 
So God, in his sovereignty, has created women to be beautiful. And he's created sexual attraction. Now, verse 2 says, The sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful. And they took any as they chose as wives for themselves. Now, again, if you take John Selhamer's view, there's nothing out of the ordinary going on here, right? The sons of Seth, who we talked about last week, saw beautiful women and they took them to be their wives. And they had children, nothing out of the ordinary. But other theologians have a different view of this verse. And, and this is where it gets challenging. Those theologians take this verse to mean something wrong. Even abnormal is being described here. Now, under this view, there are two explanations that I think are most likely and prevalent. Here's the first one. The first one is that the sons of God represent the sons of Seth. If you remember, if we go back to chapter 4, it was in the line of Seth and Seth's son Enosh where it says, this is when man began to call on the name of the Lord. So it's through the line of Seth that, that people began to relate to God. So those who hold this view believe that it was the line of Seth who went out of their territory east of Eden and they began to see the daughters of Cain. And they began to see that the daughters of Cain were beautiful and pleasing to the eyes. So they married them. And this intermarriage between the godly line of Seth and the line of Cain caused the line of Seth to become tainted. And this grieved the heart of God. Because remember, God is troubled by sin. God has always wanted people to be righteous. Now, this view is supported by other passages of Scripture, other, other principles that we see in the Bible, right? You remember when, when the Israelites came into the Promised Land and, and Moses gave them commands. You remember what he told them? He said, don't intermarry with the people of Canaan, people of the land. Because if you intermarry with them, then they will tempt you to worship their gods. You will commit idolatry. Now, unfortunately, they didn't listen, did they? And they intermarried with the, with the people of Canaan. In 2 Corinthians 6, in the New Testament, we also see this principle. We see Paul telling the church now to not be unequally yoked. And what did he mean by that? He meant that believers should not marry non-believers. He says in verse 14 of chapter 6, For what fellowship does light have with darkness? So we see a principle throughout the whole Bible that says that people of faith... God's people should not intermarry with non-believers. We see that throughout the whole Bible. And though I agree with this, I don't think marrying a non-believer is a good idea. I don't think this is the correct interpretation of this passage. I don't think this is what is going on here. The other view that has widespread support is the view that the sons of God are angels. Anybody see the movie City of Angels years ago? Yeah, that's what's going on here. The other view is that the sons of God are angelic beings. And this happens to actually be the oldest view. This is a Hebrew view. It goes back to the 2nd century B.C., 
in a book called Enoch, the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch is not in the Bible. We know that. Um, but it's also a book in the Hebrew tradition that has authority. As a matter of fact, Jude quotes the book of Enoch. And so in the book of Enoch, it says that the sons of God were angels. And as, I, as I've looked at the evidence and studied the, diff the different views, this is, happens to be the view that I hold on to. I, I think they were angels. And let me tell you why. Because the title sons of God is used four times in the Old Testament. And every time the title sons of God is used, it is used for angels. Uh, it's used three times in the book of Job. In Job 38.7, God is describing creation, his work of creation and he says, what supports its foundations? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? The sons of God shouted for joy when they saw God's creation. And who are the sons of God? They're the angels. They witness God's work of creation. Uh, the other place that sons of God is used is in the book of Daniel. If you remember in the book of Daniel, there were the three Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you remember, they were the only ones who were not willing to bow down to the golden idol, the golden statue. And because of that, King Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the furnace, the fiery furnace. Well, when King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fiery furnace, he didn't see three people. He saw four. And this is what he said. He said, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar was not an Israelite. He was a pagan, and so he was seeing this through the lens of pagan religion. But obviously, he noticed that there was one person in there who looked different. And I believe that he was describing an angel. The second reason that I believe this is the best view is because the New Testament supports this view. There's a couple passages in the New Testament, though obscure, I think possibly they might be pointing to Genesis 6. The first one is 2 Peter 4, 4 through 6. Peter says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So Peter is obviously commenting on two groups of people that did sinful things, and because of that, they incurred the judgment of God. Now, Dr. Peter Gentry believes this is not describing three different situations. He believes that if you look at the Hebrew, it's actually describing only two the first one is the angels. They sinned. They did something they should not have done. They cohabitated with human women. And because of that reality, the perversion on the earth grew. And because of that, God had to judge the world through Noah. The second is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude, the brother of Jesus, also 
says something very similar. He says, and the angels who did not keep their own position, but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality, versions, and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. According to Gentry, these two events are grouped together because they both describe abnormal perversion of God's design for sexuality. The first was angels leaving their proper dwelling and cohabitating with human women. And the second, we know, is same-sex relations. Now, I think this view of verse 2 is, is the best view. But whatever view you have, you need to hold it with humility. And that's something that all the commentators say, is that you need to be humble. Because we don't know for sure which view of verse 2 is the correct view. Moses goes on to talk about the result of this transgression. He says, And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be a 120 years. Now, the word spirit uh, is, a, is a word that we've seen before. It's the Hebrew word ruah. Right? And ruah means spirit, but it also means breath or wind. And we saw this back in chapter 2 when God was creating humans. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And the man became a living being. The word breath of life, breath is the word ruah. So again, what is Moses saying here? Moses is saying that God looked at the sinful world and what was going on there and he said, my spirit will not remain, or another translation says, strive or contend with mankind forever. God saw the sinfulness of the world and he, he said, I'm done. I'm not going to strive with them forever. And so their days will be 120 years. Now, as Pastor Matt said last week, if you look at the line of Seth, up to that point, humans were living how long? Yeah, seven, eight hundred years. Some of them almost a thousand years. God, in his frustration with humans, says no more. Not going to happen anymore. 120 years. That's how long humans are going to live. Now, that is one interpretation of this verse. <laughs> and again, there are many interpretations. God says, you know what? I'm done. I'm done fighting. I'm done striving. Humans after this point are going to only live 120 years at the most. And after the flood, that's what we see. We see that, that the lifespan of humans begins to shrink all the way to Moses. Now, the other view is the view that Pastor Matt said last week and that because of their corruption, because of the wickedness in the land, God said, I am going to allow humans to live for 120 more years. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of striving. I'm going to allow humans to live for 120 more years. Now, if you guys can get your act together, <laughs> If you can repent, then there'll be a reprieve. But if not, then the end is coming. And that's the other view. 
And I think that's probably the right view. But again, it depends on your interpretation. Could they both be correct? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they don't really contradict with each other. Mm -hmm. Moses goes on to say in verse 4, he says, The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Now, this is another challenging part of this passage. Who are the Nephilim, right? That's the question. Who, who are these powerful men? And if we go back and, and look at the origin of the word, there's not much. There's not much there. It's, it's pretty obscure. Uh, one scholar says that it, it could mean fallen ones, fallen creatures, uh, in English, it has been translated giants. Nephilim have, has been translated giants. And, and the reason is, I think, is Numbers 13.33. Remember the story of Numbers 13.33? It was when the Israelites were coming into the promised land and, and the spies went into the land. And when, and when the spies came in, they saw the men living in Canaan, and they said, these guys are like giants. The sons of Anak, they said, these guys are like the Nephilim. As a matter of fact, they said they descended from the Nephilim. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you that's impossible. But that's what they said. They said these guys are giants. Moses says the Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. The book of Enoch says the Nephilim were the children produced by the unholy union of the angels and human women. They were mythical giants who wreaked havoc on the land, right? The fallen ones. This is one possible interpretation. Another possible interpretation is Moses is saying that they're not products of the relations between angels and human women. He says they were around in those days and afterwards. And he goes on to say they were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Well, why would Moses be making this case? Because around the time that he was leading the Israelites, there were a lot of myths being spread. And those myths, one of them was the Epic of Gilgamesh. Have you heard that before? You probably heard about it in school. One of those myths stated that God's had sexual relations with humans and created demigods. So could you imagine if you were coming into Palestine and you believed that there were demigods living there? I mean, you would be terrified, right? Well, Moses says, no, 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 no. They are not the product of angels and women, no. Uh, Moses is saying these powerful men of old, these famous men, they're the Nephilim. Now, again, we don't know exactly who the Nephilim are. God doesn't give us that detail in the Bible. But one thing we know for sure is that in Numbers 13, they knew who they were. They had heard of them. But did the Nephilim survive the flood? No. No. They didn't. Only one family survived the flood. The family of Noah. Now, if this is how God dealt with sexual perversion in, in the time of Genesis, how will God deal with sexual perversion today? Increased sexual perversion in our world. Well, Colossians gives us a clue. Paul says, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual morality, impurity, lust. 
evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Paul says there will be a day when God's wrath will be poured out on the disobedient. Those who rebel against God, those who who continue to practice sexual morality and greed, which is idolatry. And Paul says, you used to, you used to walk in these things. You used to be in bondage to sin. This, this is who you used to be. But now you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you have a new power. You have a new strength to draw upon. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can put these behaviors to death. You can rid yourself of them. Not in your own strength, in God's strength. But if we don't, we need to know that an increase of wickedness grieves the heart of God, which leads to punishment. Continued sinful behavior, it it grieves God. And, And that grief will result in discipline. In verse 5, Moses says, when the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. So Moses is describing what's going on on the earth during this time. And he says, the Lord saw that, that human wickedness was widespread on the earth. And that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Now, this could be an exaggeration that Moses is saying to to make a point. But still, he's saying this is the condition of the earth. This is what was going on during that time. Nothing but evil. Every inclination of the human mind was, was wickedness and evil. I mean, could you imagine if we lived in a world today, in 2022, if every inclination of the human mind was evil, was wicked? I mean, if you broke down on the side of the road, boy, I'll tell you what, uh, that could be be a death sentence, right? You never know. Someone might come and kill you. Or if an elderly person or a, or a disabled person needed assistance, it would be an opportunity probably for manipulation, robbery. And what about children? What about innocent children, vulnerable children? If they needed help, abuse. I mean, I could not imagine living in a world where every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. But Moses says that's exactly what the world looked like. And he says the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Now, some people look at this verse and they say, how, how could God regret something? Right? I mean, isn't he the creator? Doesn't he know what's going to happen? And my response is this. Can you know that something is going to happen in the future 
and yet still be grieved over it? Yes, you can. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three different times Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be betrayed. He was going to be arrested. He was going to be crucified. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew why he had come. Yet, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was grieved about it. He was grieved to the point where he even asked the Father, if the Father, if there was any other way. So yes, God in Genesis 6 he can know what is going to happen, but his heart could still be broken when he sees it coming to fruition, when it becomes a reality. Verse 7, Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, the, and the birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. So in his regret, in his anger, God grieved over man's wickedness. And yet, we still see God's grace. It says, Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. Favor is literally grace. Noah found grace with the Lord. Now, did Noah deserve to die with everybody else? Was he a sinner? Yes, he was a sinner. Now, he was also a righteous man, and we'll talk about that next week, but he was a sinner. And the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. So yes, Noah deserved to die with everybody else. But we see God's grace here. God's grace is given to one man and his family. And through this one man and his family, God starts all over. Do we deserve to die because of our sin? Yes, we do. Uh, we, we deserve to die because of our past sin. We, we deserve to die because of our present sin. We deserve to die. And someday, as I said earlier, God, He's going to bring about judgment on the earth. 1 Peter 3 says it this way, By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Someday, God is he's going to judge this earth. He's going to judge the ungodly. But God in His grace, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, hear me on this, if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we will be rescued from the judgment. And that's God's grace. And that grace alone, that reality should motivate us to devote the rest of our lives to serving the Lord. To walk in obedience to Him. But there's another reason. There's another reason why we should walk in obedience to God. And it comes from Ephesians 4.30. Paul says, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Friends, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been sealed for the day of redemption. You are a child of God. But we can still grieve God. 
we can still grieve the Holy Spirit by our sins. And this verse has caused me to see God in a new way this week. The Spirit of Jesus feels the pain of our sin. The Spirit of Jesus feels the pain of my sin. And God felt the pain of the sinfulness of His creation in Genesis 6, and He still feels the pain of sin today. And this pain over sin, because of His love for us, leads God to discipline. Now, His discipline for us is not, it's not in a punitive way, like the people living before the flood, right? That was God's wrath. God's discipline for us is out of love. He wants to restore us. He wants us to become more holy and godly. In closing, I want us to read uh, Hebrews 12, 7 and 11. Would you read this with me? Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as children. For what child is there that a father does not discipline? No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Friends, God loves us. He, he loves us way too much to allow us to stay in sin. And so He disciplines us. Those of you who are parents know that you discipline your children because you love them. You, you want them to become righteous, right? You want them to do the right thing. Well, God allows suffering in our life as discipline, and, and that might look totally different for all of us. I don't know what that looks like. I know what it looks like in my life. But God allows that discipline because He wants us to turn our back on things that are destructive. Right? He loves us. And He doesn't discipline us because He, he just enjoys punishment. No. He disciplines us in love because He wants us to reject those behaviors that are destructive for us. And He wants us to choose behaviors that are righteous and good. That's why He disciplines us. Now maybe you're here today and, and this is all new to you. You're thinking, what? I don't understand this. I I'm, I'm learning about God. This is new, and, and that's okay if this is new. God loves you, and, and He wants to have a relationship with you, and, and that's why He sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. But maybe you, you already know Christ, and maybe you've been walking with Him for years, but, but maybe you recognize that God's disciplining you. God's trying to get your attention. Maybe there's a sin in your life. Maybe there's an idol that you're holding on to. And, and God wants you to let go of that. Let go of the destructive things so that you can embrace the good things that God has for you. Can I pray for you? Lord, thank you that uh, your word says that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. God, you are so patient with us. You are so gracious with us. And yet you love us, God, and, and, and you want us to become righteous. You want us to become holy. So I pray for all of us today, God. I, I know that, that every single person here deep down wants to be righteous. And yet, Lord, we live in a fallen world. We, we battle the flesh. 
We battle the, the influence of the world. We battle the enemy. Lord, we need your help. God, we can't do it without you. We can't beat sin without you. So Lord, I pray that you would give us your help this week. Help us to repent of our sins. Help us to turn our back on the world and to follow you down that narrow path that leads to righteousness. God, we need you. We need your strength. We need your help. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.